Sunday, February 4th, and this is The National. Tonight, paying tribute to victims of a suspected serial killer. As Toronto's gay community comes together in grief, questions about how to repair its strained relationship with police. Another deadly train crash in the U.S. How that train wound up on the wrong track and the technology that could have saved lives. Facing off in Pyeongchang, the North and South team up for their first pre-Olympic game, but get an icy reception. When facing darkness, people light candles. Facing loss, people remember. And when faced with a threat, they band together. That's a vigil, and tonight in Toronto, a vigil for the victims of alleged serial killer drew a community closer. We invite you now to greet But while people here mourn and draw strength, some also question whether police really did all they could as year after year, face after face, disappeared from the city's LGBT community. I just don't understand how... I know we have a very po good police force here in, in Toronto, in Canada, but I don't understand how it took so long. First, it was not a, a killer, and then it seems to be a killer. At this time, you don't know who to blame, you know. I, I don't want to blame the cops, but there is a problem here. There are five victims of accused serial killer Bruce MacArthur. As the community braces for more revelations, Ron Charles takes a look at the state of the strained relationship between Toronto's LGBT community and its police. LGBT community advocate Nikki Ward has complained about the way police initially handled disappearances now alleged to have been the work of an accused serial killer. At the time, back in 2010, we knew something was up and we asked for action. Ward says police failures don't end there. Whether it is a question of LGBT bias or just merely mechanical competency issues is open to uh, uh, to debate because it's not just this serial killer that case that's been mishandled it's also the case of Tess Ritchie and Alora Wells which are still outstanding and their killers are still at large. Disappointed with the police response Tess Ritchie's mother searched for her daughter and found her body at a construction site in the village. Alora Wells was a young transgender person whose decomposing body was found near a tent in a ravine. Police refused to take her father's missing person report, and so it was months before her body could be identified. Toronto Police Chief Mark Saunders admitted more could have been done in those cases. The force's LGBT community liaison officer deals with the mistrust in the community yeah. firsthand. The reality is these conversations never ended. Um, they, the bulk of them haven't been in the last six months, right, if not longer. And every time I go out and have a conversation, it's not necessarily just about the investigation. It's, there's layers to this conversation, um, which I totally recognize and the sensitivities around that. And those are conversations that we're going to continue with the community. Toronto's mayor acknowledged the community's concerns as he arrived for tonight's vigil. The LGBTQ2S community is a, a wonderful part of our community who feel an element of frustration and fear, and we're going to have to deal with that over time. I'm sure we will, and tonight it perhaps is a small beginning on that healing process. Beyond the healing provided here, the mayor is setting up a meeting with LGBT community advocates in an effort to address that fear and frustration. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. The vigil tonight comes after a significant week for the MacArthur investigation. First, MacArthur was charged with three additional murders, bringing his total alleged victims to five. Police openly said they are investigating a serial killer. They recovered dismembered remains from large planters. Now, forensic pathologists are actually examining around 15 planters identified by cadaver-sniffing dogs. And searches are in the works at more than 30 properties across the city. As the police dig into missing persons databases and tips and forensics teams analyze DNA evidence, they have made no secret they expect to announce more victims. So, Ian, let's head to the U.S. now, where there are brand new questions tonight about an old subject, rail safety. Adrian, they come after a passenger train slammed into a freight train that was down in South, South Carolina that killed two crew members and injured more than 100 people. We should have had a lot more casualties, but we did. We do have some that are in critical condition, but we're um, hoping to hear good news on those. Well, tonight, vital onboard video evidence is being examined in Washington. 
But as the CBC's Paul Hunter tells us, investigators already think they know what caused this crash. Headed south from New York and bound for Miami, the Amtrak passenger train was moving rapidly and in darkness when at 2.35 this morning in South Carolina, it suddenly veered onto the wrong track and slammed into a parked freight train. They weren't supposed to be meeting uh, right there by the bridge, clearly. South Carolina's governor described the scene as a horrible thing to see. Uh, the first engine of the freight train, of course, was uh, torn up, and the, the single engine of the passenger train, the Amtrak train, which was headed south, was uh, barely recognizable. It's uh, quite, a, quite a crash. All of the dead and injured were on the Amtrak. The two killed, an engineer and a conductor. Does this ever get easy? No, it doesn't. The local coroner seemed visibly shaken by what she'd witnessed. This is very, very hard. You know, the families are, they're very upset. And so. It's raised questions again about the safety of rail travel here. There have been three fatal crashes involving passenger trains in the U.S. since December. In this latest, investigators are already making headway. The Amtrak train. The U.S. National Transportation Safety Board says it's learned the Amtrak train veered onto those side tracks with the freight train because earlier in the day when the freight train was moved onto those tracks, a switch was flipped to make that happen and left that way. For whatever reason, that switch was, as they say in the railroad industry, lined and locked. We were able to see that it was actually literally locked. With a, with a padlock um, to make it lined to go into the siding. The question is, why was it left that way? Tonight, investigators are screening the equivalent of dash cam video found amid the wreckage of the Amtrak train. Amtrak says it is cooperating fully with investigators, but notes it's the freight train company, CSX, that controls the tracks and the signals. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Investigators say today's crash could have been prevented by something called positive train control. The technology has been around for years, but it isn't widely used. There's only one track here, and for some reasons, both trains were traveling on the same track. It was this crash involving a Los Angeles commuter train that kick-started the push for positive train control, or PTC. The GPS-based system allows automatic control of switches, signals, even braking in potentially dangerous situations. PTC will automatically use enforcement braking and stop the train with a full-service brake application. Congress mandated its use on all major rail lines across the United States, but PTC is only installed on 730 kilometers of track, mainly in the Northeast and slow implementation has cost lives, according to safety officials. Over the last decade, they estimate 52 people died in 23 crashes that PTC could have prevented. That includes this accident in New Jersey in 2016, when a train slammed into a station, killing one person and injuring more than 100. In Canada, PTC is being studied, but transport officials say for now, it's not the right fit for Canada. The original deadline for the installation of PTC on U.S. tracks is 2015, and that since has been extended to the end of this year. With the opening ceremony in Pyeongchang just days away, a sign of unity between North and South Korea. Their combined women's hockey team played their first game ahead of the Winter Olympics. The action on the ice wasn't the key focus, though. The stands were full of supporters waving the Korean unification flag. We are one, this banner declares. Outside, protesters had a different message. <laughs> it looks like North Korea is to complete its nuclear development in March, this man says. The regime is just using our Olympics as a disposable event until then. Susan Ormiston is in Pyeongchang to cover the game. So, Susan, you know, many people here in the West just see these signs of apparent unity as a big positive, but I suspect the view is a little different on the ground. 
Yeah, much more shaded and a lot more realist. You know, the decision to include North Korea here was politically popular in South Korea and with the IOC, but among young South Koreans in particular, not so much. In fact, the president's popularity dropped six percentage points after that decision was made. It's a matter of pride, really. I mean, the South Korean women's hockey team is not a strong team, but it's in a development phase, helped in part by a couple of Canadian Korean players and a Canadian American coach and it's a big deal here domestically so the fact they had to integrate a dozen North Korean players at such late notice has been a real challenge and it did not help Adrian when a government official said well it's not like they're going to win that kind of political clumsiness really ricocheted here well you know the political interest of North Korea in the games probably isn't sitting very well with people what's the conversation around that there's a lot of suspicion about Kim Jong-un's motivations for joining these games. Some North Korea watchers suggest that he got everything and gave up nothing, that he will use these Olympics to show off the, to the world North Korea's influence and power and give up nothing from the nuclear arsenal and that strategy. They also suspect that he wants sanctions lifted, and that's part of the plan. So they're saying North Korea is sitting up there in Pyongyang Yang looking at these Olympics very carefully and looking at what opportunity they have to show off to the world, really. So that's a worry. But I must say that I do have, have heard from several South, South Koreans I've spoken to a cautious hope that any kind of rapprochement, any move towards talks, maybe lead to something in the future is a good thing. On the other hand, some people say it's galling that on the eve of the opening ceremonies here, North Korea is getting so much attention. So many expectations always around the games. Susan Ormiston in Pyeongchang, thanks. The other storyline dominating this year's Olympics is of course, Russian doping. Tonight, veteran Canadian loser Sam Edney said the decision to overturn the ban on 28 Russian athletes and reinstate their 2014 results does not bode well for clean sport. The whole situation is disturbing for our team and we believe a nightmare for clean athletes. Let me be perfectly clear. This is not about a medal being taken away from me or my teammates. A clean playing field is more powerful for us than, medal, than a medal around our necks. Because of that ruling, the Canadians will lose out on a bronze medal. So many stories at the Olympics, and as part of CBC's extensive Olympic coverage, starting on Wednesday, Rosie Barton will be hosting part of this program from South Korea. This was a day of pride for Mi'kmaq activists in Halifax. A rally today originally planned as a protest over a controversial statue instead turned into a celebration. Elizabeth McMillan now on what it means for the community. Today, Mi'kmaq activists stood on top of the platform that for decades supported the bronze figure of Edward Cornwallis. He had such a nice view. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's our view now. For years, people have debated whether it's appropriate to honor Cornwallis. The British military officer is credited with founding Halifax in 1749, but he also offered a bounty on Mi'kmaq scalps. Daniel Paul started the movement against Cornwallis, raising awareness about his oppression of local indigenous people. As part of the hidden history of Nova Scotia, the scalp proclamations, they weren't discussed openly until I came along in the late 1980s. Some people have argued getting rid of the statue would erase part of the city's history. But Paul says it was a symbol of white supremacy. The contempt for our people, the Mi'kmaq people, it just wasn't proper. You don't have, uh, uh, you don't idolize people who in history uh, did every attempt to exterminate a race of people. Last week, Halifax Council finally voted to remove the statue just days after the assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq chiefs called for it to come down. And on Wednesday, it took crews just a few hours to pack it up and take it away. Today was my first time seeing this empty space and to see not only the statue removed, but the pedestal that held him up removed um, means a lot. It's, it's very symbolic. 
people here say getting rid of the monument is a step in the right direction. Having this statue removed is reconciliation. It's uh, reconciliation in action where we are seeing um, history happen. History is unfolding. It's not erasing history, it's creating a better history of moving forward. Tonight, activists are camping out in a teepee in the square, which is still called Cornwallis Park. They say they want the name gone too. Elizabeth McMillan, CBC News, Halifax. And that statue, that park, those aren't the only things Mi'kmaq activists want renamed. In addition to Cornwallis Park, there's a Cornwallis Street in Halifax, and on it, the Cornwallis Street Baptist Church. Same street name, different town, this one in Shelburne, Nova Scotia. There's also a Cornwallis River in the Annapolis Valley. Even a Coast Guard ship has been named after Halifax's controversial founder. But removing his name isn't a new idea. Cornwallis Junior High School in Halifax was renamed back in 2012. It's now Halifax Central Junior High. Well, still ahead on The National. Their car flipped over into a ditch, started filling with water, and a mystery man pulled them to safety. We'll have a Nova Scotia couple search for their rescuer. And how has a year of President Donald Trump really changed the media? Andrew sits down with CNN's media watchdog Brian Stelter to talk about the blending of fact and opinion. But first, the teenage girl igniting passions on both sides of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Daryl Derek Stoffel takes a closer look at her online videos. Depending on who you ask, they're either enraging or inspiring. I am uh, disturbed, if not disgusted, by the use of children. She's more of a symbol to us because um, she, she showed that the youth, you know, our age, uh, can do something for Palestine. stands a Canadian General Hospital housing some of Canada's casualties recently arrived from France. A welcome visitor comes to its doors, Her Majesty the Queen, who is taking time out from her many functions to visit her Canadian boys. The trim, grey-clad figure with a dazzling smile wears the diamond maple leaf presented to her during the royal visit to Canada. For three hours in every ward, she talks to the wounded fighting men of Canada. The magic of her personality banishes all thoughts of depression. After speaking to each man individually and hearing their thrilling stories, the Queen comments briefly, the Canadians are doing a wonderful job. She leaves behind appreciation for her kindly thoughtfulness. Dockyards across the Dominion, Canadian girls flock to answer the call of the United Nations for ships and more ships. Joan Canuck has forsaken Vogue and Vanity Fair for blueprints and construction plans. The frilly dresses and fancy hairdos of pre-war days have given way to overalls and workers' caps. Brother, husband and boyfriend on the Italian front and in Normandy need supplies, and supplies mean ships to carry them. Miss Canada is just the person to build those ships, and build them well with her own lily white hands. After the war, a barrage of red hot rivets may take the place of the traditional rolling pin as feminine weapon Mark I when hubby comes home late. When it comes to fixing the gas stove or the family bus, the boys will have to take a back seat. When victory is won, a great share of the credit will be due to our fair Amazons in overall. The convoy at sea represents the lifeline of our forces in the field. To maintain one fighting man in action, it requires 19 other men behind the scenes. Most of these are found handling the gigantic project of keeping the army supplied with weapons, ammunition and food, and the Air Force with planes and petrol. Under the Navy's protecting guns, all manner of craft are brought into use in the never-ending battle of keeping supply dumps filled. As soon as a beachhead is established, cargo vessels which are standing by commence pouring out their quota of stores.
It might not look like it here, but the 17-year-old Palestinian's brand is rage, and rage like hers gets a lot of attention. It's one thought reason. thought that she is too dangerous, and no bail can be posed in, in order to, to release her to the end of her trial. Okay, that's one reason she's now in jail. Now, to some authorities, Ahed Tamimi is a living propaganda weapon aimed directly at Israel. But free Tamimi has become an activist rallying cry. Petitions have popped up online, posters and protests just invoke her name around the world. Members of her extended family have been convicted of violent acts against Israelis over the decade. Her resume, sorry, her resume as resistance icon goes back years and started, perhaps fittingly, with a raised fist. Tonight's dispatch comes from Derek Stoffel in Nabi Saleh in the West Bank. For some, she is a Palestinian hero, standing up to the Israeli occupation. But others call Ahed Tamimi surely temper and say her anger is a ploy meant to damage Israel's image abroad. Yeah. Ahed is a member of the Tamimi family from the village of Nabi Saleh, which sits right next to this Israeli settlement in the occupied West Bank. The town is often a flashpoint in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Demonstrations are held here almost every Friday. It often ends in violence. The Tamimis are at the forefront of the resistance movement here. While the Israeli soldiers have guns, the Tamimis have cameras. Here's Ahed when she was almost 12 years old, shouting at the soldier, where did you take him? Where is my brother? But it's this video from last month that has made her into something of a star for those opposing the Israeli occupation. That's Ahed in the blue jacket, punching, kicking, and slapping an Israeli soldier who does not respond. My daughter and my wife are standing here. Ahed's father, Bassem Tamimi, has fought against the Israeli occupation his whole life. Arrested several times, in all he spent about four years in Israeli prisons, some of that for inciting violence. Tamimi defends his daughter, says Ahed was enraged after Israeli soldiers shot her teenage cousin Mohammed in the face with a rubber bullet about an hour before this video was shot. Two soldiers come from there and jump from the wall. Yeah. And they walk around across my home here. So they came right through uh, here? Through here and, and walk. They went. And they start pushing the soldier from here to go out. This soldier all the time rep yani represent death, injury, uh, suffering, people killed, people uh, injured. And this is the normal reaction. I think he slapped her eyes by his by his uniform, by his weapons. He uh, scared her hurt through his weapons and his shooting her cousin. The confrontation, which happened right here, was uploaded and the video went viral. And that brought some strong reactions from Israelis. I am uh, disturbed, if not disgusted, by the use of children. The Tamimi family's long history of activism was seen as such a threat to the Israeli government that this cabinet minister took action. Michael Oren headed a secret parliamentary investigation a few years ago to find out if the family was real or were their actions staged, part of what Oren calls Pallywood. But it appeared to us that they were, uh, that these children were being, um, were being chosen because of the way they looked. They, they had a Western look to them. They dressed Westerner. They didn't dress like um, West Bank Palestinian uh, children. And they were being sent um, to um, provoke soldiers quite violently, uh, biting them, kicking them, slapping them, in order to get the, the, the soldiers to strike back. In the case of this video inside Israel, the calls for Ahed Tamimi to be punished grew louder, <laughs> leading Israel's defense minister to say that whoever goes wild during the day will be arrested at night. Indeed, just days after the confrontation, Israeli security forces came to the house while the family slept and arrested Ahed and her mother. Ahed faces a dozen charges in an Israeli military court, including aggravated assault that could land her a decade behind bars if convicted. It's by and large a settlement issue. 
Gerard Horton is a human rights lawyer whose legal NGO looks at the arrests of Palestinian children. In one of his studies, the vast majority of kids were detained near Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank. And you give the job to the military of guaranteeing their protection, then the tactics employed by the military generally include uh, suppressing and intimidating the villagers living next to those settlements so the settlers can go about their daily lives in relative peace. Peace between Israelis and Palestinians remains elusive. This video, yet another reminder these young Palestinians say of the stark divide between the two sides. I think the issue of Ahdamimi has put the light again on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict because it has been an existing conflict for so many years. She's more of a symbol to us because um, she, she showed that the youth, you know, our age, uh, can do something for Palestine and for our people and for the Palestinian cause. The Palestinian fight against the Israeli occupation is now half a century old. But whatever happens to Ahid Tamimi in court later this month, one thing that's clear in the age of social media, the Palestinian resistance movement has a new face. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, Nabi Saleh in the West Bank. We have a lot more still ahead on The National. Banks are supposed to keep your money safe, but tonight we have two people who are going public after they say the big banks lost tens of thousands of their dollars. Lost. So, what happens then? First, though, The National interview. Brian Stelter is CNN's media correspondent, a role that's definitely taken on a lot more weight in the era of the Trump White House. The night that he tweeted about uh, his nuclear button, and then 12 minutes later said he was going to give out fake news awards. You know, what can you call that other than madness? Joining us now from her chambers at the British Columbia Supreme Court in Vancouver is Madam Justice Beverly McLaughlin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Congratulations. Thank you very much. You are very young to be appointed to the Supreme Court. I guess that's an occasion for a double congratulations. <laughs> you, you probably be sitting on the bench for a long time at that level. What is it that you'd like to be remembered for at the end of it all, if you can look that far ahead now? Well, uh, I suppose I'd like to be remembered as uh, uh, being um, uh, a good judge, a judge who understood the problems uh, that were put before uh, her who uh, dealt with them in a, a clear and uh, a hopefully uh, correct manner and uh, a judge who uh, also showed an understanding of the sort of problems ordinary people face and, and uh, Well, and let me interrupt you there because I, is it true that the Supreme Court hears cases usually that have to do with ordinary people? My impression as an ordinary person is that the Supreme Court deals with things that are very legal, technical, arcane even. Well, uh, the concepts may seem legal and technical and arcane, but I think the sorts of things the Supreme Court deals with are very much uh, uh, of great importance to ordinary uh, people. Uh, look at some of the recent decisions on abortion, signs in uh, um, stores in Quebec, uh, language rights, uh, charter rights. I think a lot of these things impact very strongly on ordinary people. And uh, very often the, the suits themselves are brought by ordinary people, but they have a, a, an impact that reaches far beyond the particular litigants in a particular case. So I, I do think that the, the court is very much concerned with uh, the rights and liberties of, of ordinary people. Let me ask you if there's something on the agenda, pending, a social issue, a legal problem that's likely to come before the Supreme Court that you hope does, something that you're dying to tackle at that level. <laughs> well, I don't know if judges usually think in terms of issues they're dying to tackle or of agendas that they set out. Very much what we do and what we decide is determined by the issues the litigants bring before us. We're just there to uh, decide the legal questions that are brought before us. So we can't determine our own agenda. But it is obvious, having said that, that uh, charter issues remain important. While uh, 
there has been a great deal of work done by the Supreme Court to date in defining rights and freedoms under the Charter. Uh, there doubtless will be other issues which will come forward in the next few years, and uh, those are very important. We think we've got everybody out along with their pets um, and uh, they're currently working to uh, ventilate the building and um, figure out exactly what's happening inside. On the National Tonight, a 12-year-old boy has died because of a carbon monoxide leak in a Calgary area apartment building. By late afternoon, the source of the leak had been found and most of the residents were allowed to return home. U.S. President Donald Trump set the stage for more controversy. His Super Bowl message noting, quote, we proudly stand for the national anthem. Trump has long feuded with NFL players who protest police violence against African Americans by kneeling for the anthem. And as the pregame began, there was anticipation and speculation, would players take a knee? Turns out, none did. In Ottawa tonight, growing questions about infighting among top Conservative officials during the 2015 election campaign. The main one, why was Rick Dykstra allowed to remain as a candidate? Dykstra was running for re-election in a St. Catharines, Ontario riding. According to McLean's, the party made, was made aware of a sexual assault allegation but allowed him to run anyway. Dykstra lost the election but then became president of the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party. That is until last Sunday when he resigned just hours before McLean's published the allegation. The CBC's Aaron Wary is in our parliamentary bureau. He's tracking this story for us. And Aaron, what have we learned, first of all, about that decision to let Dykstra remain as a candidate in the 2015 election? So at this point, we're, we're basically working with a combination of reporting, uh, publicly made statements by some of these, these key players and some of what our own sources are telling us. The, the reporting from McLean's magazine in particular and the public statements have focused attention basically on three key figures, three key advisors within the Conservative campaign in 2015. They are Jenny Byrne, the campaign manager, Guy Giorno, the Conservative campaign chair, and Ray Novak, Stephen Harper's chief of staff. In the emails reported by McLean's, Byrne raises some pretty terse concerns about Dykstra's candidacy. While Giorno suggests Dykstra could be dropped, and the matter could be reviewed. Meanwhile, Novak says the decision hinged on whether a closed investigation without charges was enough to drop Dykstra. A source familiar with the campaign notes that beyond the Dykstra situation, there was a great deal of internal dysfunction and unhappiness at this point in the campaign, something that might be reflected in those emails. So all of a sudden, years later, there is this focus on why he was allowed to remain as a candidate, and, and ultimately that decision would have rested with Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Right. As party leader, this would have been Stephen Harper's decision ultimately. And he has said there wasn't enough information to justify uh, eliminating Rick Dykstra's candidacy. A source that tells us that this matter was briefed to the prime minister in a conference call sometime after the investigation. It seems to be sometime after the investigation was completed into what was going on with Rick Dykstra. And that the conversation went back and forth on this matter and went on for quite a while, but that ultimately they came back to this conclusion that there wasn't enough information to justify ending his candidacy. The current Conservative leader, Andrew Scheer, has called for an investigation, and what can we expect from that? So Andrew Scheer has said that the investigation, uh, the independent investigation will produce a report, and that report will be made public. That may help us get to some of these questions of what happened, who knew what, and, and how this decision shook out. But it now involves some of the key players in this campaign, some of the key players in really the last 10 years of the Conservative Party. And it's now going to be up to Scheer to, to deal with that and to explain what happens what happens next and what really has to change going into the 2019 campaign. Okay, Aaron, thank you. Thank you. Of course, Ontario's progressive Conservatives were already in disarray before Dykstra stepped down as party president. Patrick Brown's sudden resignation triggered the race for his replacement. And tonight, alongside her four children, a high-profile name said she's entering the leadership race with a Super Bowl-themed tweet. It's game time. Caroline Mulrooney is the daughter of former Prime Minister Brian Mulrooney. The 43-year-old lawyer has never held political office, but she did become the candidate for a Toronto riding last September. She helped co-found a charity called Shoebox, which delivers gifts to women and girls in homeless shelters. 
Before he was hired by CNN, Brian Stelter was a star media correspondent at the New York Times. Really, that was just a warm-up. Now he covers the industry through President Trump's fog of misinformation. Andrew sat down with Stelter this week. We'll have that conversation in a moment. But first, some background. You are fake news. Fake news, the enemy of the people. And they are. Donald Trump's war with mainstream media is well documented. All I can say is it's totally fake news. It's just fake. His attacks against journalists were at first shocking. Now they've become expected, a well-known tool of his outsider presidency. But the very dishonest media, those people right up there with all the cameras. Amid the chaos of a commander-in-chief attempting to discredit the news media are journalists who say their work is more important than ever. Good morning, I'm Brian Stelter, and it's time for Reliable Sources. Ahead this Brian hour, Stelter is the host of the CNN program Reliable Sources, a show that examines the media world. Stelter not only covers Trump, but also what it's like to cover Trump. The challenge for people like me as, as reporters is to refuse to be confused. I met up with him in our national studio in Toronto to talk about the role of the media in the era of Trump and if the national news media itself has crossed any lines. Brian, nice of you to join us here Thanks. in our Toronto studios. Thanks Thank for you. being here. Uh, tell me, never a dull day in the United States these days, I suppose. Um, recently, there was the State of the Union address. Trump referred to this as a new American moment. What do you make of all of this? There were parts of the speech that were inspiring. There were also parts of the speech that were deeply divisive and some pieces that were downright false and, and, and filled with fibs and falsehoods. And, and that's, you know, classic Trump. Uh, what we've learned about him over the past year uh, is that he appeals in a, an incredibly emotional way uh, to a part of the United States and he deeply angers and causes resentment uh, and fear among another big chunk of the United States. And uh, frankly, I think a lot of news consumers are just exhausted by it all, uh, by, the, by the pace of the news cycle in the U.S. Well, and, and let's talk about the news cycle, because you're, you're a journalist who, who covers a lot of things. You cover journalism itself as well. And so when we look at Trump's relationship with the media in particular, the, the enemy of the American people, as he's put it, I mean, that, that, that escalates things, that, that, that ratchets things up. Yes, we have not seen this before from an American president. Uh, even Richard Nixon, when he was uh, attacking the news media during Watergate, he was doing that privately. Uh, that was on tapes that only came out later. So this is very much uncharted territory uh, for the national news, news media in the U.S. And, and for consumers of news who, who don't know what to believe. Well, the national news media, but, but CNN in particular, right? I mean, CNN is often in the president's crosshairs. I'm curious to know how that affects you and how that's affected your work. The issue is not how, how it may affect staffers, it's how it affects uh, the audience, the people that follow him on Twitter or follow him on Facebook. Uh, the daily, daily kind of fake, fake, fake talk from President Trump is poisonous because it has this, this trickle-down effect uh, that, that causes a, an erosion of credibility in, in the minds of some voters. It's hard to measure, it's hard to uh, prove that on a daily basis, but I checked on Twitter, I checked in his speeches, he said the word fake more than 400 times in his first year in office. That has an effect over time in people's minds. Uh, and so I think the challenge for us in the news media is to reinforce uh, why we do what we do, uh, how we try our best to be accurate and fair. Uh, it's a real opportunity, every time he attacks the media, it's also an opportunity for us to defend and explain ourselves and uh, to remind people of our role in civic life. To that extent, it's, it's changed the way you operate? I think it has a little bit. I, I, look, when, I, when, he, when he tweets something offensive or, or nasty about the news media, uh, and, I, and I sometimes run over to the bureau and, and, and hop on CNN and talk about it, I do see it as an opportunity. I try to look at it as a positive to say, here's, here's how we actually do our jobs. Here's how we know that story is not fake. Here's how we know those sources are real. Uh, it's an opportunity for media literacy 101 when he, when he throws out these, uh, these tweets. Well, let me ask you this. Do you accept any of the criticism? I mean, the, the extremes aside, uh, there is a, a critical look at, at CNN, the way it mm -hmm. operates, and that it has gone beyond simply reporting the facts and that it has, in fact, chosen sides. I don't think CNN is, or, or any other channel right now, is, is anti-Trump. What we are seeing are journalists trying to stand up for truth and decency. 
And uh, when President Trump gives an inspiring speech, we should and we do say so. Uh, when he uh, makes up false stats, uh, when he makes up fake facts, when he uh, spews lies on Twitter, then we say that as well. Um, I don't think that's opinion. I think that's much needed context in a really confusing world. So that raises a really interesting point too. Analysis, context, you, you mentioned the interjection of opinion. And I'm, I'm curious about some of the work that, that you've done because on air, you, you have referred to Trump as being, or suggesting at least, that he's unfit perhaps for office. You've referred to his presidency as madness. Does that cross the line, do you think? The night that he tweeted about uh, his nuclear button and then 12 minutes later said he was going to give out fake news awards, you know, what can you call that other than madness? Uh, I, I thought on a night like that when he's using Twitter to talk about a, a nuclear taunt and then criticizing the press, uh, I think journalists need to have the space and the, and the freedom to talk openly about what's going on, about his, his reckless use of Twitter. But I guess I wonder, is, is that a judgment for a journalist to make, right? That's the question, to, to, to make that judgment call. I think there's a, a healthy tradition in America of uh, aggressive, sometimes adversarial journalism, of journalists being on the side of the audience at home. And we're seeing more of that now. We definitely are. <laughs> Let me flip it around, because when you look at the negativity that's out there, and I, and I, I want to bring up Alex Jones of, mm -hmm. of InfoWars fame. And, 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 and granted, he is someone who, of course, is, is known for being inflammatory on, on that end of the spectrum. Yeah. And I just want to read some. You're very familiar with what he said about you. I've heard about in it, In particular. Yeah. But, but let me just read what he said yeah. about Brian Stelter. So... He has called you narcissistic, devil-worshipping filth. Uh, he wants to control every aspect of your life because he knows he is a cowardly, degenerate sack of anti-human trash. He's called you disingenuous, disingenuous fake, fake, false, 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 twisted, broke back, twisted, a defiler, a betrayer, a backstabber, a devil! It, it goes on and on and on it and does, on. It does, it does. How, I mean, again, his MO is... is to, to be as inflammatory and, and to spew as much as vitriol as possible. That, yeah. This is what he does. But how do you handle that? If he complimented me, then I'd be worried, you know, because he, he, he throws out all of these insults and says, I drink children's blood. Uh, some of it is, is downright disgusting. Uh, I mostly uh, ignore it, um, but I will admit that uh, some of my family members don't like hearing those kinds of things when they get amplified to millions of people. Well, and that's why this, this is a big deal, right? Yeah. Because he has a following, a big following. And, and I'm curious the extent to which you have felt the backlash, not just from him, but from all of the people who, who listen to him yeah. on a regular basis and, and in the same way that people listen to Trump, who, who believe what he said. I, you know, look, I look at Alex Jones as the dark side of an amazing phenomenon the ability for anyone to publish anything on the internet. And that has caused a lot of good in, in, around the world. That has caused a tremendous amount of good. However, y you know, when you look at these conspiratorial programs that spew hate and vitriol, that's the downside. That's the dark side of this amazing digital revolution. And as long as we can give people tools to, to know the difference, then I think things work out just fine. What I worry about is people who might not be able to discern the difference between Infowars and The National. That would be a problem. And so I think we need to give people better tools to tell the difference. As an American journalist who has covered at length Trump's presidency and, and I, I suppose the presidency that came before, I mean, what is the burning question that, that you want answered? What, I mean, if you had five, ten minutes to sit down with him and to discuss, I mean, what, what is it that's top of mind for you? He seems to try to create his own realities, whether... It's claiming that millions of people voted illegally or claiming that anything having to do with Russia is a hoax. To try to get to the bottom of, of that may not be possible, may not be possible for anyone uh, to figure out, but it sure would be worth trying. With President Trump, it might be useful to just dig down deep on one topic. Why do you call the Russia thing a hoax? What really did happen before Election Day? And try to dig on, on one of those topics. But hey, let's be honest. He's not giving any interviews right now to anybody that's not his friend. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. Well, certainly there would be much to discuss. Uh, Brian, <laughs> it's been wonderful to Thank talk you. to you. Thanks so much. Thanks.
Up next on the National, go public investigation. What happens when the bank loses tens of thousands of your dollars? And what explanation did you get from the bank? They don't know. I, they literally didn't give me any explanation other than it happens, it gets lost, it could have been paid out on someone else's loan, but no explanation. And today, where's that money? Where's the check? I don't know. The National with Knowlton Nash. Good evening. The government is going to draw a line right through the Northwest Territories. Native groups agree with the decision to split the territories in two. But as Whit Fraser reports, there are still obstacles ahead. Last March, residents of the Northwest Territories voted in favor of dividing the region. They felt the great differences, including linguistic and cultural differences, between the Inuit in the Eastern Arctic and the Indians and Whites in the Western Arctic made it unworkable as one territory, especially when it covers an area that makes up nearly 40% of all Canada. The government's decision today is conditional upon Northerners being able to resolve the difficult question of where the boundaries will be and upon native groups settling their long-standing land claims. But both government and native groups seem to agree there's now a greater incentive to resolve their differences. The fact that, that uh, we've recognized the principal division, the fact that they want division, will probably make them more zealous and determined uh, to get a settlement at the bargaining table, force us to, to work with them at the bargaining table to get a conclusion. Monroe is also giving more power to the governments of the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. He says the federal government will no longer control their purse strings. They'll know what they're getting. They can set their own priorities and accept their own political accountability for what, what they do with that money. There's optimism today's announcement will end bitter political and constitutional fights among northern people. I, I think this will re remove a lot of roadblocks, and I think uh, um, uh, life in the north will become much more normal from now on. Northerners will be involved all the way and that it's not a set of decisions imposed from above by a federal government, which they could have done because a lot of these things are really in the federal jurisdiction. And the Member of Parliament for the Eastern Arctic Riding of Nunatsiak, Peter Atenuar, has left the New Democratic Party to join the Liberals. Today in the North, he told his constituents it'll be easier to work for constitutional development from within the Liberal Party. While both the Prime Minister and John Monroe welcomed Atenuar, they said there were no prior deals and he certainly hasn't been guaranteed a job in the cabinet. And Atenuar's move is not likely to cause him any difficulty in his constituency. Traditionally, party labels don't apply in the Northwest Territories. Lately, there's been a general move by Native people to work within the Liberal Party. Whit Fraser, CBC News, Ottawa. The move toward more responsibility for both the Northwest and the Yukon Territories brings them closer to provincial status. But the government says that is still a long way off. There really has to be a vision that says, here's how the territories is going to develop. It's not, it's not, be, not going to be based on dividing up the money by population. It's not going to be based on a vision. And, and we have never been able to achieve that. It's going to be a tough job to ever come up with one that's going to make everybody happy. And I, I don't think it'll, it'll happen in, uh, in my lifetime. Um, and I've seen it at the <laughs> That's my money, why isn't somebody taking care of it? Where is this money going? Why is it lost? And who isn't doing their job at the bank? Is it still sitting in some guy's drawer? We think of banks as safe places to put our money, right? Well, not so much, according to some customers who approached our Go Public team. Two of Canada's big banks lost their money. And as our Go Public reporter Rosa Marcatelli explains, it seems they were in no hurry to find it. It was a mess she had to clean up herself. It started when Ashley Robinson sold one of her cars in October. She gave Scotiabank $21,000 worth of certified checks from the buyer to pay off her car loan. Somewhere along the line, the bank lost her money. So we have my second bank receipt. While the checks were missing, the bank's loan department was calling Robinson, demanding she keep making payments for a car she no longer owned. My reaction was anger like how can this happen and what explanation did you get from the bank they don't know 
I, they literally didn't give me any explanation other than it happens, it gets lost, it could have been paid out on someone else's loan, but no explanation. And today, where's that money? Where's the check? I don't know. They don't know. Scotiabank says while mistakes are rare, human errors can happen, and it works with customers to make things right. In Robinson's case, she fixed the problem herself, convincing the person who bought the car to issue another certified check. Jesse Hardy had a similar experience with TD Canada Trust. It lost $17,000 of his money for almost a year. Stock certificates he tried to cash went missing. To me, it just seems like they just had, they did not care at all. You know, they said, you know, it was like, we're the bank. All, we have, we're all holding all the cards here. He says he called every week, but it took months before TD even acknowledged the certificates were missing. The money was supposed to help his mom out financially. You're trained your whole life to, to say that, you know, you put your money in your bank and, and it's always going to be there for you. It's not just the stress with dealing with the bank, but it's also the stress of knowing that, you know, my mom needs this money. TD tells Go Public Hardy's case is unusual, saying it regrets the length of time it took to find the money. Customer advocates say the banks aren't responsive in situations like these because they don't have to be. There is no requirement for banks to respond to problems quickly or repay money that's lost. Uh, the banks really control the process. Uh, they have all the money on their side. Uh, using consumers' money to defend themselves with their team of lawyers that will delay and frustrate a lot of people, get them to walk away. You might be wondering just how often banks lose customers' money. We tried to find out, but couldn't. The banks won't disclose those numbers. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. There are two national agencies that work to resolve customer complaints with banks. Our Go Public team found that in 2016, they sided with financial institutions in three quarters of the cases. Now, if you'd like some help from our team, you can send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. Well, up next, the uh, search for a mystery hero. That's our moment of the day. But first, we want you to hear from a teenager at the heart of a story that we told you about a few days ago. You may have seen this photo of a junior hockey player in Mont-Tremblant and his hockey hero, Sid the Kid. Guillaume Ouimé stepped out onto his rink alone on a cold January morning. The next thing he knew, Sidney Crosby drove up and asked to do a few hockey drills. Here we are in Mont-Tremblant. As you can see, it's the prettiest ice in, uh, in all Quebec, I'd say. So I was just skating around right there when I saw someone coming towards me. When I realized it was Sidney Crosby, I didn't know what to say. I just approached him and told him, uh, hey, Sidney, and I guess that's how my fairy tale began. I met a man so humble, uh, so kind, so generous of his time. I really uh, understood why he's the best player in the world, always willing to make little efforts to work on every aspect of his game. I guess that's why he's the best player. Just his work ethic is unbelievable, and I was really shocked by his humility. What a great man. So Guillaume sent us that video message when we asked. And of course, the cool thing, Adrian, in all of this, this is not somebody who took a selfie and it immediately went viral. That picture was actually taken by Sidney Crosby's girlfriend. And you know what? I think one of the nicest things about this is that when a reporter first approached Guillaume and said, hey, this is a great story, can I tell this story? Guillaume said, you know, I should ask Sidney and his girlfriend if they're okay with that. So he, he asked. They said, no problem. Just do us a favor. Please don't... Please don't talk about who Sydney's dating. And he said, no problem, I understand. Followed through on that, kept his promise. This is, you know, this is such a Canadian moment, but such a civilized moment in an era of all the social media mayhem. It was very nice. A mango is a mango is a mango, right? Well, not quite. These mangoes have been zapped. They've been irradiated with a dose roughly equivalent to 10,000 chest x-rays. Good. Approved by the FDA, Taste. the USDA, nice. the EPA. Mm. Delicious. Delicious. This peculiar taste test took place in Miami Beach two months ago. Lorenzo's became the first place in North America ever to sell irradiated fruit. And there's a chance irradiation may come to Canada. Instead of mangoes, we may end up eating zap chicken. The irradiation of food may become one of the hottest health issues of the 1980s. Here is the first really new method of food preservation. You want to get nuked? 
Sure, go for it, and let's build a silo in my backyard. Well, I have eaten the radiated food, and I certainly would, would actively look for it if it was in the supermarket. This is cobalt-60, a byproduct of Canada's nuclear reactors, and the most common power source of food irradiation. This is how it works. Chicken, for example, goes into the irradiator on large pallets. Inside, the cobalt-60 rods are raised from a pool of water. The chicken revolves around the radioactive source. The rods are returned to the water, and the irradiated chicken moves outside. The government is now considering allowing the irradiation of poultry for two reasons. Firstly, to cut down salmonella poisoning. Most cases of salmonella poisoning in Canada involve poultry. Secondly, to extend shelf life. For 40 years, scientists have studied food irradiation, and most have declared it safe. They point to the astronauts who munch their way to the moon on zap steak. They say it's safer, cheaper, and more effective than chemical sprays and fumigants. Sprays and fumigants that in some cases have been outlawed. We're looking in agriculture for non-chemical means of protecting the crops or the animals. Dr. Norm Tape of Agriculture Canada has just been made chairman of a UN group of all 26 nations that currently irradiate food. Irradiation isn't going to be a panacea. It's not going to be our milk supply, our breads, and uh, our meats, and our fish, and all that. I think there are going to be selected applications where there are health benefits, and it's economically feasible. The people that work here at Atomic Energy of Canada Limited have asked the government for approval to irradiate poultry. They're waiting for the government's decision with great interest. Most of the 140 irradiators now in use around the world have been produced right here. In the majority of cases, they're used to sterilize medical and hospital disposable goods like surgeon's gloves or cotton swabs. It's a multi-million dollar business, a growth sector in a nuclear industry that has been slumping badly. If the government gives the green light for food irradiation, AECL could be the big winner. Well, we're talking many millions of dollars of business a year, well downstream. Bruce Wilson is AECL's director of marketing. He sold irradiators around the world from China to South Africa, $15 million worth over the last year alone. Given that you have a regulation in place, you have the world's biggest and best supplier of this technology in your own backyard. One of the stories we're following on The National this week, the Prime Minister will head to three U.S. cities later this week to try to build support for NAFTA. He'll be visiting Chicago, San Francisco and Los Angeles. The final round of negotiations with the United States and Mexico will be held in Mexico City later this month. Well, a couple in Nova Scotia have been looking for the man who saved their lives. They were driving home uh, late in the evening when they hit a patch of ice. Their car flipped into a ditch. Their incredible survival story and their search for their hero is our moment of the day. I didn't have any pain. It was a lot of adrenaline, and we need to get the heck out of this car, like right now, <laughs> as it was filling up with water. It was like, I sat there and like, no, there's no way this is real. This would never happen to us. When I looked to my left at the driver window, I could see water and, and it was going up the windshield, like up the window and it had covered the driver window completely. Then it started to get really dark. So, and, that, and small dark spaces and hearing things like crack and, and rumble and it was just, it was terrifying. Alex and his girlfriend were hanging upside down. They managed to get out of their seatbelts. That's when the stranger helped pull them through the back door. He gave them his jacket and called 911. My glasses, I lost those. Uh, so when we got out, I, it, and, and being so shaken up, I couldn't see the guy very well. If it wasn't for him uh, opening that back door and helping us get out right away, uh, I feel like we could have got severely hurt in the cold water. You know, it's amazing. Uh, Alex Pinio says not only does he not remember what, what he looks like, didn't, didn't get his name, all he sort of vaguely remembers is that the song Bad Day of Fishing was, was playing on the radio and that as soon as he and his girlfriend were okay, they put out a Facebook call to look for this man and I'll let you do the honours because they found him.
They found him, whether it was remembering the song or the power of social media or mainstream media, they found him. They will connect with him tomorrow. We will have more on this story. And just a reminder, there are a lot of uh, fantastic people out there that do heroic things. That's Absolutely. the National for February 4th. Good night. Good night.